Futures Radio Show, sponsored by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world effectively manage risk. For access to free educational tools and resources for the active individual trader, please visit activetrader.cmegroup.com. Every day, traders and investors dive in to tackle the ever-changing markets to find opportunity. Futures Radio Show is your number one source for answers to the questions that all market participants want to ask. Veteran futures trader Anthony Crudelli sits down with the most influential leaders and top traders in the industry. Now, here's your host, Anthony Crudelli. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in for this episode with Darren Carlett. Remember, new shows are posted on Mondays and Thursdays. You could subscribe to the show on iTunes and YouTube. If you're enjoying the show, please leave a review on iTunes. Before I play today's interview for you, I want to give a shout out to the great sponsors of Futures Radio Show. CME Group, Trading Technologies, FTSE Russell, RJO Futures, and Top Step Trader. To learn more about these sponsors and the important things they are doing for futures traders, be sure to click on their logos on futuresradioshow.com. Today I spoke with Managing Director of Spread Edge Capital, Darren Carlett. Darren explains how he got into trading commodity spreads, why he chooses to trade spreads, and his process for trading them. He explains why seasonality is the most important part of his strategy, how he uses volatility to size his spread positions, why price action is more important than the fundamentals, and last but not least, the biggest challenges Darren has faced going from trading his own money to customers' money. So without further ado, let me take you right to the interview with Darren. Darren, how'd you get involved in trading futures? Well, I started trading futures about 10 years ago. Um, I had gotten a subscription to a website for some data that they provided. And I just started kind of looking around the site and saw different things that they offered. The site was more research and they specialize in spread trading. So I followed some of their um, trades for a while, saw that they were doing well at that time. And then I started just actually following along, opened up an account, and, and started trading. Did you have any prior experience in trading before you started to learn about spreads? Not in futures. That was my first uh, foray into futures. But I had been trading uh, stocks and options for probably 20-plus years prior to that. So I tried a number of different things. Um, I had, was quite active in the options market. Uh, and I've just always kind of been looking for what I thought was the holy grail. And um, when I kind of came across this top style of trading, um, it's really worked well for me and I've, I've stuck with it. What is it specifically that you like so much about spread trading? You know, the uh, initially um, I had a full time job while I was trading. So, um, Watching the markets, uh, looking at daily charts, just wasn't an option, right? So the strategy fit my schedule. Um, I do everything um, based off of end of day closes. Uh, and I'm actually able to plan out my trades um, multiple days in, a, in advance. So. Um, the initial strategy fit perfectly with the fact that I had a full-time career. Uh, now, I've retired from uh, that career, but the strategy is still the same. Um, I spend time during the market because I want to, not because I have to. Um, I do most of my research on the weekends. So I just play on a strategy, and then the week becomes about executing the strategy. So you found a strategy that fit your personality and schedule. Yeah, I'd say that's, that's exactly right. What markets do you primarily focus on? I currently trade um, primarily four markets. Uh, pretty much all the energies, all the grains, most of the softs, 
and then all three meets. Uh, in total, it was about 22 commodities that I follow. And you spread all of them? Spread them all. So um, spreads really can consist of an inter-commodity, uh, for example, um, crude oil versus gasoline, or it could be crude oil, two different months within crude oil. Uh, I started trading inter-commodity uh, for, for myself and for customers, but um, I've begun to specialize in just the calendar or the intra-commodity spread. So crude oil, I might trade June versus September as an example. Now let's talk a little bit about the strategy itself. You mentioned that you're planning your trades a day or even longer in advance. So talk to us a little bit about the development, how you develop the strategy, and then just give us some of the details as to how the strategy works. Okay, the, the key thing about it, and the way I like to um, frame it up is really the name of the program that I trade. It's, it's, it's a diversified seasonal calendar spread trading strategy. And so the diversified, I'm across 22 different commodities. I never know what's going to be working at any given point in time. Something's always working, you know, so I want to be across as many as possible. Um, it's the seasonality that really makes this um, process work. Commodities just have natural tendencies that repeat over time. Uh, some of the obvious ones would be, you know, heating oil going up in the winter, gasoline going down in the summer, uh, grains having um, growing seasons where they're fresh crop and storage crops. So those create very consistent and repeatable patterns. And my strategy is really about exploiting those patterns. So correct me if I'm wrong, but your strategy is primarily based upon seasonality. Absolutely. And that's what creates the predictability or the scheduling part of it. So just as an example, every weekend I will plot out my trades. I literally have a, a, um, a stack for every day of the week. And I just start off on Monday, peeling off the Monday trades. I execute them. Same for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So and, and there's very little, um, it's not often at all that I will vary from that strategy. Now, the reason I can do that is because these seasonal patterns start at specific times and end at specific times. So the vast majority of the time, and I mean 98% of the time, um, I, may, I know when I'm going to enter by the day and when I'm going to exit by the day. And that's what kind of works on the predictability of the schedule uh, and how I can, um, you know, set it up in the weekends and then execute it throughout the week. Seasonality is something that everybody can see. So there's nothing proprietary about it. What separates you and gives you your edge over other people that are trading using seasonality? Well, that's a, that's a great question. I, I think it's really the spread trading part of it. Um, outrights do move seasonally as well, but the interaction between two months um, is a little bit unique. And um, now usually, um, you know, it's based off the front month. Um, if I'm long the front month, that's usually a bullish position. But the commodity can go up and the spread can get narrower. And um, so it's a little more complex than just watching the outright. Uh, there, there's, there are very definitely things um, unique to the spreads that you wouldn't see in the outright market. And I would just tell you that there's just not a lot of people um, in tune with that. How long did it take you to figure out that that was your edge and eventually turn profitable trading a spread strategy like this? You know, I was fortunate that I was immediately successful. Um, I, I would tell you that that was probably more luck than skill at first. 
Um, so as I mentioned, I was following a website that published data and literally just placing those trades. But one thing I figured out very quickly was that if I screened the trades and I compared the seasonality to the current market action, I could weed out a number of the unprofitable trades. So just as an example, if a spread usually is at five and I'm expecting it to go to 10, um, obviously there's a five point move there, but if it's sitting at nine on the day that I would place it, the moves already kind of happened. So I would start to exclude those. So it's not just about the seasonality, but when I added looking at the charts and looking at um, where the current market action is in relation to the seasonality, I can you know, exclude trades that um, have a much lower probability of success. So that's the refining that I've done over time. Um, again, I started off kind of just following the trades from a website, and now I do literally all of my own research just with a database that does all the number crunching behind the scenes, but I look at that in relation to current market action to come up with my final picks. So you took the basics of what someone was showing you on how they traded seasonality using spreads, and then you just evolved it in, into your own strategy. Absolutely. Well, one thing that I saw that was flawed in that uh, strategy I began was the time frame between when they posted the trades and when you actually entered them. There sometimes was as many as a seven or almost eight week lag between when they were posted and when you would actually enter them. And a lot can happen in those seven or eight weeks. Right. So um, now I'm, I'm looking at, you know, usually I'll finish up my prep by Sunday and I'm planning trades out for Friday. Now, um, a lot can happen in four days. So um, it's not unusual for me to plan to place the trade on Friday, look at it Thursday night and say, nope, not doing it, right? Because you know the action just in those you know, few days has changed my view. Um, but bringing in that time frame between, you know, when I've made the decision to go and when I've actually pulled the trigger is critical to it. Well, let's talk about you doing your homework on a Sunday for a possible trade opportunity on Friday. Take us through that process. What are you looking at? Are you using any charts? Walk us through that prep. Yeah, so I, I subscribe to a, uh, a, a website. Uh, it's called Season Algo. Um, I think it originates over in Czechoslovakia. Um, there are other ones out there, but I, I really like this one. The great thing about it is, and I think this is kind of a learning for all trading, is that the markets are closed, right? There's no impulsive decisions. Um, I'm looking off of closing prices on Friday. I'm deciding on what I'm going to do on Monday. You know, there's no time rush to make a decision. I take my time. I work through it. I come up with a strategy. Um, it starts off by looking at different indicators, um, and I have a proprietary way of ranking and scoring them, right? So how, how do you compare a wheat trade to a crude oil trade, as an example? Um, I have a scoring system based off its past profits and past drawdowns that uh, allows me to take two unrelated trades and compare them together and decide which one of the two I want. Um, and then, of course, I'm looking at the current market action, and, of course, I'm looking at my, my current holdings. Um, if I've got a, a bunch of energy exposure on, I might go towards the wheat. You know, diversifying is, is a critical part of it. But I, I think the most important thing is that the markets are closed, and I'm there's no emotion going on in terms of watching you know, the markets move and having that drive my decision. Uh, I don't find that to work very well for me. Can you take us through a recent trade example that you did from soup to nuts? Uh, well, the, the, almost all of them are the same in terms of I've, I've identified a trade over the weekend um, based off of the average profit to drawdown ratios. 
Uh, I've planned to open it on, let's say, uh, you know, September the 1st. And I open it. And let's say I plan to schedule it on October the 1st. Um, I am monitoring the price at the end of the day. Uh, and I'm really looking for, the only thing I'm looking for is what I would call extraordinary market action. Uh, and so this, this is a critical part of the strategy is, is just understanding the difference between what I would call normal price action and then things that are extraordinary. Now, the extraordinary doesn't happen very often. Um, great example of one where it did happen was the drone strikes, you know, in September um, on the side of oil fields. That's extraordinary. You need to react to that. But but most market action is just normal, and I don't react to that at all. Once I've set a strategy, if there's not something unusual that happens, I'm going to place it on September the 1st, and I'm going to close it on October the 1st, and it's very rare that anything causes me to change that. So every single trade sets up and is executed basically the same. In terms of it has a predefined entry point and a predefined exit point. Yes. Now talk to me a little bit about position sizing. Are all of those trades the same size, the same aggressiveness or less aggressive? How does that work? Yeah, because I'm trading for uh, customers, um, lot sizing is critical. Um, I'm, I am either doing you know two lots or one lot, and of course customers can have multiple lots. But um, and that's based off of uh, I use the average profit per day as a way to um, measure volatility, right? So a low volatile trade. Would, I would place two lots in a higher volatility trade. I would place one lot. Um, a big driver of the volatility also is the month, the expiration month. So the closer into the front month you trade, the more volatile trade tends to be. So right now the front month for uh, crude oil, as an example, I think is uh, November. Um, so put trading that front month is much more volatile than trading say June of 2020 right now. The other big factor is the distance between the two calendar months, right? So a November, December spread, which just has a month difference between them is not very volatile. Whereas a November, say September, 2020 would be extremely volatile. So I, I control volatility by both how close to the front month I'm trading and the distance between the front month and the back month that I'm trading. Hey, everybody. I want to take a moment to thank one of our sponsors, FTSE Russell. They are a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. The Russell 2000 Index is a key benchmark for small cap U.S. stocks. Be sure to check out the E-mini Russell 2000 Index Futures contract symbol RTY. For more information on FTSE Russell and their products, please visit footsierussell.com. When you get into a position, you said that you have the set entry and the set exit. What about yeah. if things don't go your way? Because I don't trade spreads. I'm curious, how do you put a stop in? Can you put a stop in? Yeah, I got great question. And again, uh, I would use the the very recent example of the the drone strikes in the Saudi oil field. That that caused extraordinary market action. Obviously, yeah. um, the energy gapped up over ten percent Sunday night when the when the futures markets opened. Um, I, I have done extensive back testing on those types of situations. Um, what I've actually found with spreads, and again, this is unique to spreads, so I, I wouldn't say that this would work the same on outrights. Actually, if you hold them, you actually will perform a little bit better. But the problem is um, that the 20% of the time that it doesn't work for you, it works horribly bad for you, right? So, um, and and getting blown out of the markets or having multiple really bad days in a row is unacceptable, uh, both for me personally, but especially for my clients. So 
Um, in a situation like that, the, the first thing I'm going to do is cut my exposure in half and then wait and see what happens the next day. Um, if I don't react to it and you get three or four or five of those days in a row, you can literally get blown up. And um, I do trade at a low enough margin that there's really no you know, fear that that's ever going to happen, but not reacting to obvious things that are occurring in the markets is just not wise. So um, I will always, in those type of situations, cut my exposure back. If it continues, I'll continue to cut back until I'm flat. Um, back in October, about a year ago, natural gas literally did blow some people out of the market. And um, I actually did quite well with that. Uh, I was flat within a couple days. And then several weeks later, um, I started to dip back into the market and actually did extremely well on the backside of the trade. So living to fight another day is, is by far the highest priority. So let me just make sure that I'm clear on this. You don't work hard stops. You just trade low enough margin. And if a big move like what happened in oil happens, you trim those positions or possibly even cover them entirely. But ultimately, you have to react to what the market's doing when you're in your spreads. You can't have an immediate exit like a stop. Right. Yeah, I I am. Um... The market's gapped high enough that I clearly would have stopped every energy position um, last Sunday or that Sunday night. Um, you want to be able to catch the snapback with a portion of it. So it's, it's straddling the fence a bit, right? I mean, if that would have gotten any worse, obviously the best choice would have been to stop everything out and move on. But um, it, generally what happens is there is a snapback the other way and you want to be able to catch some of that. So it's kind of a bit of a straddle strategy where, where you're, you know, cutting it in half um, to keep from getting blown out, but also having some exposure so that you can catch a bit of that move back. Um, this strategy has been something that I've back tested uh, and the whole the whole notion of where to place stops is kind of one of the biggest dilemmas that a trader faces. Um, getting jiggled out of positions it will just drive you crazy. So getting those stops set in the right place is is critical. I found that managing the commodity, not the trade, is the way to go. So, for example, on crude oil, I had four positions opened. Right. It's not just one big trade. It is for smaller trades. So closing two of them um, was the, was the move. And had we got another move on Tuesday, I would have closed the, either one or both of the ones that I had left. Trim your positions. Wait to see how the market reacts. Yeah. And I'm, I'm in both of those. I'm, I'm in both of those other positions because, you know, the, the, the market has started to come back to where, it hasn't come all the way back, of course, but it's it's edging back down again. And that's kind of the norm. Um, I mean, for a situation like this, so, so again, every situation is a little bit different. This was kind of a, a one-day scare. Um, and once um, they got the, the oil back online, everybody calmed down and, you know, we're, we're kind of hedging back into normality here. Uh, now, I'm being careful with energy now because, um, you know, it's not like the problem hasn't gone away. Um, you know what I mean? There, there, there could be any number of other things that could happen still from here. So I'm treading lightly in the energy space right now. So I'm um, working more in the meats and softs and grain area and less in energy right now because for obvious reasons. Well, we talked about how seasonality plays an important role in your strategy, but I'm curious, how much do fundamentals impact your decision-making? You know, I almost hate to admit this, but not much. Um, 
because I trade 22 different markets, I, I, I can't sit here and tell you I'm an expert in all 22 markets. I make my decisions based off of historical seasonality compared to current price action. Um, you, you wouldn't have to know anything about the markets, but to see a spike in energy, again, going back to that example, tells you all you need to know. What exactly caused it? it is important, but, you, but then you get into a lot of guessing about, you know, how are people going to react to it, right? right. Um, it's, it's mainly about the price action that drives my decisions. Um, without knowing anything about what caused it, I still would have made the same decisions. You trade your own money and clients' money, but you came from trading your own money first. I'm curious, what are the biggest challenges you faced for trading clients' money? Yeah, I traded my own money only for about uh, four, about five years, and then I started trading for clients. Um, I did so well with the spread trading that I very quickly had nothing invested. In fact, I'd taken out well more than I'd put in. So I, I was playing with other people's money. And of course that, when you get in that situation, you know, your, your tolerance for risk and your tolerance for volatility is high. When I started trading for other customers, I very quickly realized that they didn't have the same tolerance. Right. So, um, I, that's why, that's one of the main reasons I got, uh, I stopped doing the inter commodity, spreads because those spreads are exceptionally volatile. Now they do very well, but the volatility is, is very high. So that, that was the decision I made to bring the volatility down um, because I really believed that my customers um, would not tolerate the same level of volatility that I'd become accustomed to. Now, an interesting ha thing happened when I did that. Um, I didn't realize that the strategies needed to be very different. The decision rules for an inter-commodity spread and an intra-commodity spread are very different. And when I stopped trading um, you know, the inter-commodity, I, I uh, was able to really refine the decision rules on the calendar spreads with intra-commodity and perfect it. In the last year and a half, I've started to trade inter-commodity in a personal account. I'm not doing it for clients yet, and I'm doing extremely well with it. Um, but the decision rules are different. So breaking that out and doing it separately has worked out extremely well for me because now I'm coming up with different decision rules for the two different strategies. I haven't figured out what I'm going to do with that yet. And at some point, I'm going to introduce it either to, to customers or maybe ease it back into my current customer accounts. I haven't really decided how I want to do that yet. Last question before we get into rapid fire today. Are you doing anything away from the screens to work on mental and physical health to help you with your performance while you're at the screens? Yeah, I, I play a lot of golf and I uh, like to work out. Um, and I, I find that staying healthy, um, staying active, um, and having other priorities is critical. Um, as I mentioned, I don't really have to spend time at the screens every day. And so, um, in a lot of ways, my stress level is lower just because of that. I'm looking at end of day prices. Um, I'm trying to be as unemotional uh, as possible. Um, I think every trader tries to trade like a machine, but um, my strategy enables that probably more than most. Great stuff, Darren. We have rapid fire questions next if you're ready for those. Yes, sir. All right, everybody. Our rapid fire segment is sponsored by Trading Technologies. Trade the global markets with TT. They are the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. Now with integrated tools for advanced options trading, cryptocurrencies, and trade surveillance. 
You can try it now for free at tryttnow.com. Darren, first question for you. What trader has influenced your life the most and why? Well, I'd have to say Jim Cramer because, um, he, first of all, he's just entertaining to watch, but he's constantly talking about diversification. And that's something that I think is absolutely critical to my strategy. The other thing that I kind of picked up from him is that big wins need the same kind of reaction as big losses. Um, and I never really thought of it that way. You know, when you're winning, you're thinking, hey, that's great. I should do more of that. But if you're winning too much, the same steps as losing too much really need to be thought of, right? That, that's a pretty clear indication that you're overexposed. What was one of the hardest things for you to overcome in trading? I think for customers, it was the volatility. Um, you know, the, the, I was able to handle the volatility in personal accounts, but that same volatility in client accounts became a problem. So I really had to find ways to bring that volatility back in check for my own sanity, but uh, also for the sanity of my clients. How has your trading process evolved over the years? You know, one thing about trading is that you see the same basic things over and over again. And um, I'm big on process. So if A happens, I want to take action B. And over time, I have um, back tested um, a number of different situations. And now I'm becoming a lot more, um, you know, rules based decision making. As things happen, I have a very specific script that I handle it. And um, if I want to vary from that script, I need to do some back testing and, and, and change the script. But when an action happens, I want to have the same reaction. What is one attribute you believe every trader should have? I think the ability to trade without emotion is critical. Uh, the hardest part about trading is, is uh, being able to kind of put a, a bad trade or a bad day behind you and just to keep you know, plugging through with your strategy. Favorite book about trading? You know, I think the, the Peter Lynch's book, you know, One Up on Wall Street, um, I'm not sure they taught me anything about spread trading, of course, but it got me interested in the markets. And, um, you know, I spent 25 years in the markets before I even started trading commodities or futures. So um, that background and that love of trading was something that I kind of got from Peter Lynch's book. If you had to pick one profession other than trading, what would it be? You know, that's a hard question because I really love what I do. So I would have to be, and I'm not saying I'm capable of this, but like a professional golfer or something that really, you know, focused on things that I love. But I love what I'm doing, so I, I can't imagine changing that. What's the best piece of advice that you received about trading? I think that a market has a way of finding your weakness. And I'm always thinking about that. When I look across all my current holdings, I think about what's the worst thing that could happen. And if it's easy to see, then I probably need to change that. If you could go back in time and give the younger you a piece of advice, what would it be? I think it's reacting to normal price action versus what I would call extraordinary price action. Um, if When I place a trade and the market moves somewhat normally and I get stopped out, this, and of course I've changed that, that, that's just a bad strategy because I'm, I'm getting knocked around by what I would call normal price action. Um, you've got to have a strategy that allows the, the normal things that happen day to day in the market from knocking you out. If you had an elevator pitch me your edge in spread trading, what would you say? I'd say the strategy is very simple. Commodities have a seasonal tendency that are predictable and repeat over time. And my strategy 
find a way to profit from that predictability. Last question for today. Favorite thing to do when you're not trading? Well, I've already mentioned golf. So that's, that's right up there. Um, and then I, I like to watch politics. I, I, there's a lot of things that are, that are going on in this world. And I'm, I'm curious uh, and, and just watch how that occurs. Where can people find you on social media and give us a website to check out? Yeah, I, uh, my Twitter is uh, my name, at Darren Carlett. Um, and then my website is uh, spreadedgecapital.com. So that's, that's, that's just my name. Darren, thank you so much for joining me on Futures Radio Show today. Hey, thank you, Anthony. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you have any questions or comments for myself or my guests, please visit futuresradioshow.com and sign up to be a premium member for free. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes.